Well, hello. This is hello. a very, 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 very super special episode. Mm. We have not one, but two special guests here today. <laughs> We've got <laughs> little Chester. Say hello, Chester. Well, he's, waiting. he's waving. So, so until we've got video, um, until we're on YouTube, you'll just have to imagine Chester. He's purely with COVID, bless him. So he's hanging out in my office. And we've got a planned guest here with us as well. We've got my good friend, Mary. Hey, hello, Mary. Hey, Mary. How are you? Hi, guys. I'm good. I'm good. I'm so, I was so nervous to be here, but also just so honored that you invited me on. And uh, it's so nice to meet Sam, finally. Yeah. This is so cool. Like we haven't like properly hung out. So um, yeah, you're so welcome. And it's so good to meet you properly. It's super. It's super. I'm so glad that you're here because this is a very special episode. So we are at episode big five zero fifty. Oh my goodness. Mm. 50 episodes. And so we kind of wanted to mark the occasion with a very special conversation. Mary is a dear, dear, dear friend of mine. And uh, I've been saying to her for a long time, I wanted her, I wanted her to come on the podcast and you know life happens and gets in the way and it was one of those things that was bumbling along in the background and I thought well when's a better time to bring her on than for a celebration episode so Mary is going to talk to us about something really special she's going to share her story and then she's going to talk about motivation which is a really really fantastic subject and it just what she what she has to talk to us is just the essence of what this podcast is all about. So it's like just perfect synchronicity. And I'm so excited. So Mary, oh, over to you. Where, where do you want to start with your story, my love? Well, let's take it back. We'll take it back a little bit. Um, and I want to apologize in advance for any unplanned guests on my side. Um, a few <laughs> things on, that I didn't anticipate about our time today might have an appearance by an animal and perhaps a small background noise from a teenage boy, but give you. Um, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully those things won't happen. Um, yeah. So basically I love, you know, when I was, when I was starting the journey of going alcohol free, one of the most useful things to me in the beginning was listening to Annie Grace's podcast, the Snake Naked Mind podcast, and just mm. listening to people's stories over and over and over again. And um, I found that so comforting and so informative and so helpful. So um, I love that format. And I love how you guys have given that format and that opportunity to a lot of people as well to let them come on and, and tell their story. So I'll, I'll start there. Um, growing up, didn't drink much. My family didn't drink much, um, but started to experiment a little bit with alcohol in high school. And I was thinking about it last night in anticipation of coming on the show. And I, I realized that I never, I never experimented with having a drink. I only experimented with getting drunk. Yeah. That was, <laughs> you know, when I think about the first time I drank, it was also the first time I got drunk. And that's, that was always the point. That was always the purpose, you know? Um, but luckily for me, that wasn't a huge part of my high school experiment experience. I did it a few times. And then um, kind of learned that I didn't like it and I didn't really like that environment. And I didn't like the kids who were kind of hanging out in that scene. It just didn't feel good to me, um, which was good because it kind of salvaged my high school experiment experience. But when I got off to college, I went to college on the other side of the country from where I grew up. So I grew up in, in Salt Lake City, Utah, which probably is known the world over for being filled with Mormons and being a dry, state so kind of interesting I didn't grow up Mormon um, my family did drink a little bit but I grew up in this very homogenous um, monoculture and then I went off to college in Philadelphia on the other side of the country and I think in retrospect looking back alcohol was a really good tool for me at that time to uh, feel accepted, to feel more self-confident, to deal with the stress of being away from home and not knowing anyone and not really knowing how to care for myself. Um, I was a very immature 18 year old. And so um, partying and drinking became pretty much my major in college. I don't, I, there wasn't a lot of studying going on. And with each semester, there was more and more partying and there was less and less studying. 
Um, and it all kind of came to a head uh, in my third year when I actually went abroad to London to study at LSE. And as you both probably know, the drinking call the drinking culture in London, as well as like the university culture in England, it's like pretty heavy yeah. drinking, perhaps even more so than in America. So we had a bar, we had a pub in our residence. And we also like the social life of the university all centered around the, the bar that was on campus. And it was just a very hard partying time. Um, and I really like sharing this part of my story. And I'm, without, you know, speaking for hours, we could all, t in telling our stories, we could do the three hour version or we could do the 15 minute version. But I like telling this part of my story because I really think that I had two different drinking careers is how I like to put it. And my first drinking career was characterized by, I think now looking back, I would characterize it as severe alcohol use disorder. And that was my early twenties, very heavy drinking, hard partying. And it kind of culminated with me at age 24, realizing that like something needed to change. Things were just, things had completely devolved. I had dropped out of school. I couldn't show up to work. Um, I was suffering from depression because how can you not be depressed when you're consuming that amount of alcohol. Um, and I got really lucky in that I, my husband, we got married very young. My husband, and I was about to say at the time, he's still my husband. Um, at this time, my husband went, was a student and he went to the library and he came home with all of these books about alcohol use disorder and um, emotional health and emotional growth. And I started reading them. And that was enough for me just to gain that little bit of knowledge was enough for me to abstain for a few weeks. But I didn't really have any formal support or any informal support. And I didn't go to AA and I didn't have a therapist. And I didn't have any friends who were doing the same thing that I was doing, but I was able to abstain for a few weeks. And then something happened, which enabled me to abstain longer term, which was I got pregnant. And at that time, I mean, and I always include this because I think, you know, for some women, maybe getting pregnant isn't like it, it doesn't help them to abstain. But for me, it did like it wasn't even a question. It just wasn't even a question anymore that I wouldn't be drinking because I was pregnant. Sorry, sip of water. And okay. um, <laughs> So that was really great in terms, I mean, it was really great for many reasons. It was my daughter, Sophia, and she's 17 years old now, and I'm so glad she's in my life, and yeah. she totally changed my life and my husband's life. And my pregnancy with her also afforded me this opportunity to um, kind of, you know, abstain from alcohol for nine months and to kind of get my life back on track and get my health back on track. Mm -hmm. But I still, I didn't know anything about alcohol use disorder. I, 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 besides those few books I had read, I really, I really didn't have the knowledge or the tools. Um, so after my daughter was born and once she was kind of reliably sleeping through the night, I started thinking, you know, like I'm, I'm different now. I'm a mom and I'm older now and my lifestyle is different. There's no way I'm going to drink like I used to drink, like I could probably start just drinking a little bit again. And at the time I was 25. So everyone I knew was still drinking a lot. And it was very much a part of the social scene amongst all my friends. And um, I didn't, it didn't even cross my mind. Like, I, I think I thought a life without alcohol would be a life of isolation or ostracism. And I couldn't imagine like being part of society and not drinking. So I started a little bit to like reintroduce to experiment with like, okay, I can have a drink after my daughter goes to bed. And luckily and interestingly, over the next 15 years, I was, I was more or less right that I never went back to the levels that I had been at as a young person. I never went back to that really intense binge drinking or drug use or any of that stuff. Um, it was a much more insidious creep in where it was just, um, you know, something, one or two here or there. And eventually, after 15 years of that, my routine was pretty much that I was religious about drinking every single night. Like, I mm -hmm. could not miss my drink. It had to happen at five o'clock. 
and every day, no matter what. And there would be things that, you know, I, I couldn't do because I knew that I had to be home to have my drink or that I would avoid doing. Um, I can't tell you how many like events or things I went to that like I, my husband and I would leave because the bar would close or, oh, they're not serving alcohol. Well, let's get out of here. Like our lives were very um, centered around it. It was such an important part of our lives. And we didn't really question it. I didn't question it. I thought it was normal and it was what I saw around me. And I thought it was normal because I was at, I was, you know, measuring it against this idea of somebody who gets DUIs and um, throws up and has horrible blowout arguments in public or, you know, like I, I, I had this litmus for what it meant to have alcohol use disorder. And I didn't even know that term at the time. And my life didn't match that. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I had to drink every day and couldn't miss my, my evening drinks, the fact that you know, maybe once a month, I would have a terrible hangover on a Saturday and not want to be around my children. And it just seemed like it was normal and natural and just part of life. And it was just the price that we pay as adults to, to have a social life, to have fun, to enjoy nice things. Like it just was not something I questioned. Um, and then in the fall of 2019, my husband started to question his alcohol use and it had been accelerating a lot and he was such a functional drinker that it I didn't even really notice but um he noticed and he he expressed to me a desire to cut back and the way that I reacted to that kind of alarmed me a little bit when he said to me he wanted to cut back I was I was kind of repelled I thought oh god that sounds horrible like good luck to you and I will not be joining you in that. I think that those are my exact words, actually. I'm like, have fun. I'm pouring myself a glass of wine right now. What can I get you? And, and that kind of alarmed me. And I started reflecting on it a little bit more. Like if I'm not addicted to alcohol, why wouldn't I have said, oh, you're going to cut back? Oh, that's a great idea. We'll do it together. Like, why would I, why was I so emotionally attached? I found that a little alarming. And so I kind of started mulling over that idea and I got really interested in Quitlet and I was reading, you know, all the memoirs and, and, and in this very detached way, like I didn't realize that it related to me yet. I was reading it as if I was like this interested third party and it had nothing to do with my life, but there must've been a reason why it was so compelling to me. Like I was yeah. reading them like addictively. <laughs> so <not> mad. <laughs> <laughs> and then my Kindle, because this was all I was reading, my Kindle recommended this naked mind. And I was like, oh, okay, this one looks interesting. Opened it up, started reading it. And that was the book that just totally changed everything for me. I just, I just needed that key information that I now look back and I think, why is this not something we teach kids in school? Why this basic, basic, it's like, it's like as if they didn't, you know, I didn't know how babies were made. And then I got pregnant. I'm like, of course I developed, <laughs> of course I developed alcohol use disorder. No one explained to me that this is an addictive substance. Like it just seems it's flabbergasting at this mm -hmm. point, you know, but for all of us in the work that we do and the thousands of people we talk to who have alcohol use disorder. So yeah, I, I started with a 30 day experiment and I lasted like 20 days at, by staying in and doing nothing. And then the first time I had a social event, I thought, well, there's absolutely no way I'm going to a dinner party and not drinking. Um, and then of course, as soon as I did that, it was, you know, off the wagon back to my normal habits, kind of like almost immediately for a couple of months, but I really missed, I really missed how I had felt in those initial 20 days. It was like the first time I'd gone 20 days without drinking aside from my pregnancies since I was 18 years old. Like mm -hmm. I didn't even know what it was like to experience adult life mm -hmm. without alcohol. And in my pregnancies, I always felt, I didn't like being pregnant. I always felt, forgive me, fat, unattractive, hated the way I looked, hated the way I felt felt really resentful and left out that I wasn't able to drink like everybody else was. And so it's not really a fair um, test to see if you enjoy life without alcohol, because you just already feel like it's this punishment, like you can't drink because you're pregnant. Mm. And so yeah, and 
and the oh, other thing, ahead. Mary, just to interject in that, because the, 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 this is it, it's so common. I, I love what you said about um, I've not experienced adult life without drinking because we typically don't. And certainly in, in pregnancy, the you know the, the, each of the three were different, and there were there were some things that I enjoyed about it, and some things I absolutely didn't enjoy, and my feelings about being deprived or not were were different with all three of them. But you f you can generally feel pretty crap when you're pregnant, um, all, all different phases of it, and so you know you any any feeling any of the benefits of having removed such a toxin from your system you're possibly not going to notice it anyway for the very fact that you feel you feel crappy particularly in those early weeks that I like, felt bloody oh, I felt bloody terrible it was horrific and and then as you say cognitively if you are entrenched in beliefs of you know the, the grass is greener somehow and you're missing out then you're not even giving yourself the chance to to know what it's like so you know, I, it's, it, it's a really interesting time because it's, it's a long time to abstain, but it can be fairly meaningless in, you know, the big scheme of things. Cause it, it, oh, you know, right. it, it, it just, um, it, it, it's just so, it's so different to actually taking a break for a, a another reason, I think. Yeah. And, and that's why the alcohol experiment is so, um, so much different than somebody who just white knuckles through 30 days, why it's so important to do that mindset work and to acquire all the knowledge that you need. And yeah, you're totally right. Like the symptoms of pregnancy actually are kind of similar to the symptoms of somebody who's using alcohol, like um, moodiness, nausea, headaches, um, fatigue, like those are all the symptoms of pregnancy and they're the symptoms, symptoms of like drinking too much. So, yeah, so then I finally, um, I finally set another day one. I had all these friends in from England, actually, we were living in Beijing and all these friends came from England and we were touring around the country and drinking every day. And I kept thinking, I love them dearly. And I kept thinking, I can't wait till they go so I can stop drinking. That's really <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <Been there. laughs> they left and then April 15th, I think that was the day that they left. And that was also the day that I didn't drink. And I had, that was April 15th, 2019. So actually earlier in the story, when I said 2019, I meant 2018. Anyway, it's neither here nor there, but um, so yeah, it's just been three years. And, um, but I think the imp important thing to say was, those, those early months of sobriety were so awesome for me. It's such a transformative time. I don't know if, how it felt for, for you both, but I just felt so amazing. And I felt like I had discovered this amazing secret or like the emperor's mm -hmm. new clothes or something. I just felt like, I can't believe I've been feeling like I've been poisoning myself for 20 years and feeling generally just a little bit subpar a little bit more depressed than I should have been a little bit more anxious. And suddenly, you know, I definitely had the pink cloud. Basically I had an amazing first few months. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, that's kind of, and then I, I, and why I continue on this journey, like you don't always have the pink cloud and definitely after about four to six months, things kind of level out. And suddenly you, you re kind of return to your baseline of happiness, still feeling a million times better than when I was drinking, but not on fire every day about like, oh my God, I can't believe this new discovery. You know, things kind of level out. And I think that's important for people to know because I work with people in the path who are getting to that point, four months, six months. And, and it's, I see it across a lot of different people, this plateau. Mm. Um, and the reason why, I've stayed alcohol free all this time and I don't intend to ever drink again is because it's not because every day is rainbows and sunshine, but it's because when you're not drinking and you're experiencing life authentically and as it really is, and you're receiving all the cues loud and clear, including clues from the outside world, clues from your inner world, you're propelled into this life and into this version of yourself, which is so much more authentic and so much more rewarding 
So I just want to offer that to anyone who's listening and thinking about, okay, so I did it. So now what? Well, you're going to reach plateaus and you're going to experience discomfort. And that is good. Feeling bored, feeling uncomfortable. That is good. And for the 20 years that I was drinking every day, I never felt bored or uncomfortable. <laughs> and so I was never propelled into growth or change. Yeah, that's anyway, it. <laughs> yeah, no, I was going to say, like, I love what you said. And I feel as if it's almost like all of the, you know, the pink cloud thing, it's, it's interesting because it means different things to different people. But I had that experience as well, where for the first few months, and I had like a one month and a three month and a six month and a 19, I had like these quite a few long breaks. And it was like each time I was like, ah, cracked it this time. <laughs> Didn't happen. Um, but, you know, it's like you, the, William Porter talks about fading effects bias and there's like the memory is fresh. So there's kind of like this direct comparison of like, oh God, I felt crap. You know, very often we drink ourselves into such a hole that those, and then the preceding kind of like lift of everything rebalancing and coming back and we're running and yoga's better or whatever it is. We're like, wow, this is incredible. And, and it is like that. And then, as you say, you kind of like things start to balance and we find a bit more no, kind of normality and that's great. But then there's like this amazing opportunity for self-growth and development. And I think like exactly what you said, Mary, then it's about actually becoming fully human and learning to feel everything and understanding that there's no such thing I, I don't like this what that like negative emotion it's like to me it's like there are things that don't feel nice in the body but they're not like bad they're not things we shouldn't be having they're just it's all part of the special effects department it's all part of the richness of life and the more we let go and, and go through that next process which we're going to talk about I know ah man like there's so much so many gems in there and so many, and I think for me, I got caught up and I was like, oh, well, I'll go back then. Like once I hit that bit a few times and uh, I would just implore, like we were all on our own journey. Nothing's lost if you go back, it's fine. You're just going to get more data, but you don't need to, you know, ask me how I know. <laughs> um, but I love what you said. That's so great to hear, Sam. And I think yeah. that would be so beneficial for people to hear because same thing, I, I, in the path, you see people who go back mm. and I think what you just said will be so reassuring to them. And I, and I, I just want to clarify what you said about bad or negative. I really liked that. So you try not to describe certain feelings like, like boredom, frustration, anger, sadness. You don't like to label them as bad or negative. Yeah. I don't want to make a, like, so language is, a, is, it's really hard, isn't it? Because when we use words, we're never sure you, we've got the same meaning behind them. But I don't want to cast a judgment on anything I'm feeling in the moment because I feel like we're experiencing what we're experiencing. It is. It's already happening. And, you know, some things will happen in life where we're, it's very wise to feel grief or to feel things that are challenging and, and can be painful. And they're there to teach us and cleanse us and, and walk us home. And it's often the judgment of bad, not good, don't want and the repression element, it, it means that thing hangs around, it kicks around, it can become toxic in a way that it just won't if it finds expression and flow. So yeah, I find like, whatever words you're using, it's all okay. Like, it's, it's all okay. Like, it's all beautiful. It's all part of the human experience. And it's in the flow that we find the like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that answered your question. No, well, I love that so much. And I, I've been using the term bad feelings or negative feelings a lot lately, because of exactly what you're talking about, like trying to coach people through this idea that um, our bad feelings, our negative feelings are welcome. They're part yeah. of the human experience and we need to welcome them in and accept them. Um, but I really like that reframe, reframe of why can't they just all be feelings? Why do we have to classify them as positive or negative? And it reminds me of that expression. I don't know if it's a Buddhist expression or something, and I'm sure you both probably know, but it's um, nothing is good or bad. It's thinking that makes it so. Yeah, mm. yeah yeah i really exactly. like that it's all it just is right yeah yeah so hey take us into this next part of the journey like what came next well that's a really good question what came next i don't think that i can it's a lot of abstract things really you know and and there were so many times when i i wanted to catalog or list these are all the things i've achieved since i stopped drinking so i could have mm. this concrete proof of this is what happens when you stop drinking, you know? And what I've realized over the years is most of the things that I've gained have been completely abstract. Um, 
the greater peace of mind, mm. greater peace in general, emotional stability, self-confidence. Um, my relationships with my the people in my life are so much stronger. Um, my boundaries are so solid. I love saying no. It's my favorite word. Yeah, the joy of missing <laughs> out. Jomo. So good. <laughs> And the so thing is, I, I, I know Mary very, very well. And she is very says good. no all the time. Very good at saying no. <laughs> it, you know, she'll say no to you in a way. Like it just feels like you're you're getting the greatest gift and a hug all at the same time as the no. <laughs> yeah. And when, when when Ellie and I coached together, it was awesome because Ellie's response, I we're, we complimented each other well because Ellie's Ellie's response was always like what are you not doing that you could do to nourish yourself and to contribute to greater peace and happiness? And I'm like, what are you doing that you should not be doing? <laughs> <laughs> so good. Well, it's kind of the same question in a different, in different clothing, right? In a strange yeah. way. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Because in not so, saying no, you're, you're acting one way or another, like you're, mm. you're allowing something, like you said, Mary, you're allowing something in that maybe isn't right for you. Right. Yes. And I think that's so huge. And I just see it again and again and again mm. with clients. I just think it's, it's a huge part of why people become dependent on alcohol is that they're um, living a life that they don't really want to live yeah. or making a lot of choices that they don't want to make and doing things out of obligation, out of fear. Um, and alcohol makes that palatable. It makes it comfortable. And, and so then when they quit, that's a big part of the work is like, okay, what things in your life were you just surviving? And do you need to actually make change, you know, in? So, so yeah, to, to answer your question, it's been a lot of just inner growth, personal growth and, and, and becoming a, the snake of mind coach, working with clients. Like I never, that's so far out on a limb of something I would have done back when I was drinking. I just was a much more fearful person, much more um, wanted to stay safe, wanted to stay. I didn't, I was very risk averse, anything that could potentially, um, I don't know, hurt my ego or, or make, you know, expose me to judgments or make me vulnerable. Like I just was very, cautious about that kind of stuff I preferred to stay really safe in my little cocoon and and alcohol enabled me to do that because not taking risks not growing staying stagnant is very uncomfortable yeah. and alcohol makes it comfortable and so then you remove the alcohol that's the other thing I see people go through you remove the alcohol it's like okay well now I have to grow because human beings have to grow mm. and so yeah, so that's kind of been, it's just been a lot of growth and um, yeah, trying things that I would never have tried in the past because I would have been too fearful. I love what you just said. It's like being in the comfort zone for too long is uncomfortable. And so then we reach for things to take the discomfort away. That's so true because yeah, like we're shedding skin and, and coming anew and what's on the other side of those waves as they come is yeah like it's it's I, I haven't I mean I've thought about it but the way you express that I think is really really powerful that's so so true um yeah so cool and I think as well it's um when we have that feeling that we're supposed that there's more and it will come out and it will sort of display differently for different people but in the background there's this feeling of like something isn't quite right like you know I'm, I'm creative I should be expressing myself you know when I was a teenager I had all this this like you know this all this energy and like where is it and it, and it nips at our heels and it nips at our heels I mean Ellie talked about the beach ball that we're pushing down and alcohol is like an extra hand that helps us just hold that beneath the water just a little bit longer um but that's where it, that's the magic right it's in that it's like when we take our hand off and the beach wall comes flying up and all this, like at first that can be very affronting and like, oh my God, what, what's going on here? But that, that's where the magic is, like in learning to surf that bit. That's the, uh, you were talking about, Mary, we were talking earlier about like having something to move towards or move through mm -hmm. like that. That to me is where the magic is. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Um, yes. That's something that I think about a lot too. And 
it's the um yeah what we were talking about was this idea that when we first make a big change like eliminating alcohol from our lives it's usually this the motivation is to move away from pain mm. and that can motivate people for 30 days 60 days 90 days sometimes and and i mean some people maybe can do it for years living with this fear that they're going to go back to where they were but who wants to move through life like that being motivated by fear right mm. And, and, and this kind of reminds me of something I wanted to weave in here too, because I had this really awesome experience. Another thing that I never, ever would have done back when I was drinking. Um, I'm a big fan of Elizabeth Gilbert and she hosted this awesome yoga and creativity retreat up in the Berkshires um, a month ago. And when I saw it advertised on Instagram, I was kind of like, is my gut instinct to the nature that I'm always fighting against is this nature I have to like stay safe and stay small. And so my, my instinct was like, oh, like that's too ambitious or that's too cool or that will be too expensive or I can't leave my family or whatever. But I worked against that instinct and I wrote to my friend who was my, um, one of my best childhood friends and she lives in Hawaii and she's a really interesting person. I haven't, I, I rarely get to see her. And I wrote to her and I said, do you want to meet me at this retreat for the weekend? Thinking there's no way she lives in Hawaii. She's going to come to Massachusetts for a, for a long weekend. And she said, yeah, I'll come book it right away before the tickets sell out. So I went with my best friend from fifth grade up into the mountains to this retreat with Elizabeth Gilbert. And it was the coolest thing. It was so amazing. It was so transformative. And I, I didn't even know what I was getting myself into. I didn't know why I was going or what I was doing. I just knew that I loved this writer and I wanted to hear what she had to say. But so much of what we did during that retreat was so congruent with what we do at the Snake of Mind. And it was just so affirming and so cool. Mm -hmm. And one of the things she talked about is, um, you know, like the first thing she said when she brought us there was, um, you know, I want to talk to you about living a creative life. And that doesn't mean writing poetry or drawing pictures or, you know, making sculpture or becoming a modern dancer or anything. What I mean by living a creative life, anyone can live a creative life. And what I mean is leading a life that's led by curiosity yeah. and not by fear. Yeah. And I thought that was so, so cool and interesting. And so to, to your point, to kind of bring that back, talking about like long-term motivation and, you know, we don't want to be stuck in that, you know, led by fear. I can't drink today because if I do, my marriage might fall apart or I might gain weight or I might have a horrible hangover tomorrow or, you know, we don't want to lead a life that's led by fear. We want to lead a life led by curiosity. So mm -hmm. it should, the motivation where, where my motivation comes from is this idea of like, what's going to happen next? What happens if I don't, if I don't escape, if I don't numb, if I don't just do what the status quo is and what's expected of me, what happens if I lead this bold adventurous life of being raw and vulnerable and, and taking life on in its own terms? what kind of things could happen next mm. so um, it's, it's so cool um, it's mind. wicked awesome it, it, i love how you talk about it mary and how how incredible that those words came to you from dear elizabeth on that retreat and that the whole like that where you talked about your initial gut reaction was oh that, that's not for me and it's too expensive and so all of the fear yeah. and so was was the opening curiosity like that that other voice that you listened to was it curiosity that's such a good question such an interesting question you know what it actually was was something that I learned in our coach training and I think I kind of you kind of start to figure this out when you're not drinking anyway, but having Annie articulate it to us and, and teach teach it to us was very helpful was this idea that your fear sometimes is a really good sign that you're in the moving in the right direction. Yeah. And, and I had lived my whole life thinking that fear was this like big red warning signal like stay away. And to cultivate this kind of more nuanced understanding that sometimes, sometimes you're going to experience fear and it's going to be a sign that, that 
you're moving in the wrong direction and you need to keep yourself safe or protect yourself. But mm -hmm. sometimes your fear, and, and I guess what we need is more precise language. But so sometimes your fear, it's really just insecurity or lack of belief. Yeah, as it seems to me, like fear, the way I like to think of it, and I mean, you know, this is, it may be helpful and it may not be, but fear seems like a proportional response to something that's happening in the moment that's going to genuinely keep us safe. And anything outside of that falling into insecurity and anxiety is kind of like a thought generated perception of what may happen or what could have happened or it's the special effects department. Um, and yeah, that's so interesting, right? I love what you said about curiosity, because as it looks to me, like everybody is doing what makes sense to them at their current level of understanding. And then something piques our curiosity, we chase it, our level of understanding increases, and then curiosity has different channels. And it's like wisdom, like it, like it has different ways to run. So the things that made sense to me when I was like 16, just don't make sense to me anymore. And the more you follow that little trail of curiosity, the more like opening there is for insight and we're all living a creative life, right? We're all creating with the universe literally experiencing itself. So you, we can, and like creation doesn't have to mean writing and reading and poetry. It could be just, be, just being how you are, like how you walk around and like how you choose to interact, right? I, I love everything you said, that's so cool. Thank you so much, Sam. And I'll just give the reference as well in case people are interested. Um, Elizabeth Gilbert actually wrote a book of, basically the book is about this idea of living a creative life mm. um, and it's called Big Magic. I don't know if you have read it. I've got it on my, do you know what? It's on my audible list. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's and I awesome. Haven't read it. Cool. Really good. Really good one. If people are interested in that concept. So. I'm going to have to have a dig in. I'm going to have to dig yeah. in. Um, what, what do you think, Mary, about, this is kind of closely tied to that curiosity uh, versus fear what 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 comes to mind is that like I think as we be, as we become more connected to ourselves and over time we learn to trust ourselves and so for me what this felt like was this turning down of the ambient noise and the voice the voices of others and this turning up of my own internal voice. But we, we can often be faced with decisions or it, it might be a bit like the, the choice to go on a retreat or not, that there will be things that come up where it, it doesn't feel right, it feels uncomfortable, but for, not for the reason that it's a growth opportunity, but rather that it's incongruent so like it, it doesn't match our values and our, whatever our latest expression is. And I think about this quite a lot, like how, because I, I kind of know for myself now what it feels like when it's either, you know, the, the, this, is, this is uncomfortable, but it's right for me versus this is uncomfortable because it's my inner knowing telling me it's not right for me or it's not right for me right now. Do you, do you know what I'm talking yeah. about? I do know what you're talking about. And I would love to hear how you know, um, because you probably have a beautiful um, strategy for knowing. <laughs> but I, I, would, I would say for me, the biggest thing is giving, my, giving myself time mm -hmm. and getting out of a reactive state. So I, I, I kind of move in slow motion and I don't make decisions quickly. Um, but I mean, maybe I, maybe I do. I don't know what, what am I comparing myself to, but let's let, maybe what I'm trying to say is I don't make decisions as reactively or as quickly as I used to. Mm. And now that I'm older, I realize like there's no fire and I don't have to decide right now. So um I, I give myself time. That's the first thing. And I breathe and I tune into my literal gut, like how it feels in my body, how it feels in my, in my tummy. And I think we just know. And I, I, I was just talking about this yesterday with a few people 
Um, but Glennon Doyle talks about going to her knowing place and going and lying down in her closet and just breathing and then the knowing will come to her. And I also listened to this great, I really listened to this great interview yesterday with Oprah Winfrey where she talks about um, when you're not sure, you just need to get really still. Yeah. And in the stillness, that the answer will come to you. And when you start polling people, you know you are lost. <laughs> what do you think I should do? Do you think I should do? And, you know, then you're just lost. So the, I think those are the answers: stillness, breath, and time. And you have to trust yourself. And actually, that is the coolest thing about not drinking and not using mind altering substances is that it doesn't matter how still you are. It doesn't matter how much you concentrate on your breath. If you're still regularly consuming alcohol, the connection between your frontal lobe and like your inner knowing, it's just going to be muddled. You're never going to have that really strong. I know what's right. I know what's best for me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think, and, and then the other thing I would mention, and Ellie, we talk about this a lot as friends, like we'll support each other with this when we're debating whether, uh, you know, we're going to make a certain choice or not. There's always the question of, well, what is my underlying motivation? What am I looking for? And there have been so many times when, when both of us have said, oh, you know what? I just realized I don't want to do this. <laughs> I'm looking for the validation. I, I wanted. I thought I wanted to do this, but I just wanted validation. Okay, never mind. I'm not going to do the thing. I'm just going to valid self validate. Hundred percent. A hundred percent. That is. It, it's so so helpful. It's so helpful because you can go off. You can run off pursuing something that you know doesn't feel right, and that even if you get the external validation, like how fleeting is that? Like what can be given can easily be taken away. So I yeah. love what you say about giving yourself, like <laughs> giving yourself the space for, for clarity to, to present itself and then being, being clear about what you really need. Because if it's not in the thing, then, and, it, and really it's never going to be in the thing. But you can, you can give yourself exactly what you need. It's so beautiful, Mary. I love it. I love it. And we've had many, many a conversation. And again, like this is a lovely thing about having, I think one of the best things that's presented itself to me in these last two and a half years is the friendship that I have now with people like you guys that I've never physically met yeah like it's so freaking deep the cut like the conversations that we have the places that we go to together I like, don't even know you're but, real I've never actually <laughs> I'm like, not, not be <laughs> <laughs> but we get, like we've we've been to some really scary places together I'm looking more at Mary than at Sam right now. I haven't, I've taken, I've taken Sam on a journey of perimenopause, which has been delightful <laughs> for him. <laughs> I've learned a lot. That awesome. is a scary place in, the, in some respects, you know, but we, we've, we, we've traversed some serious ground in the last two and a bit years. And it's, uh, it's wild. And no matter how uncomfortable that gets at times, like I wouldn't change a freaking thing. There's no way I would want to go back to, having surface level relationships and a deprived sensory experience of embodied life. No, thank you. For sure. And that's, you know, not to continually plug the TNM programs, but um, that's why the path is so cool. And I, I, it's just crazy. And in my group coaching that I've done, and we've done groups together, Ellie, whenever you bring a group of people together who are doing this together, it doesn't matter who they are, you know, what their socioeconomic background is, what their belief system is, you bring them together around this topic. And within a couple of weeks, it's like, like people telling each other, they love each other. The intimacy is, and it's not phony. That sounds very phony, but it, it really isn't. It's really, it's really amazing. The intimacy that's cultivated and the support people find. So that's another thing I would say to anyone who's listening, who's thinking about what kind of support do I need? Um, community is so, so important. 
Yeah. And yeah, I'm so, so grateful for our friendship. And I can't believe you two have never met. Like you both here in the same country and it's not a a super large country. Like how many hours would it take? We we have this, like, we have this, um, I was saying to Ellie the other day, yeah, I'm going to have to drive down. Well, we, we had some plans, but they fell through. (laughs) <laughs> go, oh, go, so, oh, you're about to blame us on Simon Chapel. No, he well, it's not his event. Well, it's not his fault that it was cancelled. It was COVID. Um, I don't know how far it is. Six hours. Well, and, and oh, that it, that's must be that's pretty yeah, far. Hang, hang on a minute, because yeah. what Sam's negating to mention here is he's driven past my house how many times? <laughs> you dri- I don't. I don't recently. No, I don't drive past Cambridge to come home. Honestly, I don't. You do. You're cro- you... Technically, I don't. <laughs> Technically. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> technically, no. it's in the it's in the area. He's in the no, next county. Of course, it goes to the next county. And doesn't bother. Where do you me. live, Sam? Doesn't bother, does it? I live up in Liverpool now, so I'm up oh, in cool. uh, in the northwest. But my parents are over in in Norfolk, which it doesn't border Cambridgeshire, does it? <laughs> geography is geography is not my thing, See, but it's fairly close. No, it is quite close. <laughs> I came I this close to meeting Ellie. Like we were about, I was oh, about no. a week out from my Fucking flight. Hell. I'd, I'd, booked, I'd booked us the best day. We had massages booked. We had dinner at the Ivy. We had some mocktails lined up. It, it would have been be awesome. awesome. It'll it will happen. Will happen when we do it one day. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mary, before we um, round up, can you tell us um, about your coaching business? And like, I, I love... I, I always remember when we were training and you told us the name of your coaching business. I was like, that is so fucking cool. And then I found you a t-shirt to, to match. Oh, I should have worn my t-shirt today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do wear it around proudly. So my business is called Good Witch Coaching. And Ellie got me this awesome t-shirt that says witchy woman. And I wear it around DC and scare people. Um, <laughs> But the reason why it's called Good Witch Coaching is because, um, yeah, my journey to becoming alcohol free was I didn't have a coach. I didn't have anyone. I didn't have any mentors. I didn't have any. I didn't have anyone. Um, But what I learned was that everything was inside me that I needed. That's what I learned through going alcohol free. And that was so, so cool and so empowering and probably the most meaningful and impactful part of the whole journey is that. I just am fully resourced here and I don't need anything external. And so this thought of, I, you know, my coaching business, what I want to do is help people access that. It's not about, you know, giving it to them or it's not that they'll need me or depend on me. It's that I'll walk alongside them as they figure this out for themselves. And, um, so that's what, because the Good Witch and the Wizard of Oz, if you remember from the end when, you know, Dorothy, now I'm forgetting the story. You should have told me you're going to ask me this question, Ellie, because I'm, <laughs> I'm ill prepared. <laughs> but um, at the end of the story, oh, right. Okay. Dorothy realizes that the ruby slippers that the Good Witch has given her at the very beginning of the movie is all she needed to get home was those ruby slippers. And one of the characters, I don't remember if it's this, I think it was the Tin Man he asked the good witch, why didn't you just tell her that? And she says, she, she wouldn't have believed me. She had to discover it for yeah. herself. Mm-hmm. And, and that's what this whole thing is about. You know, nobody can just tell you, you have to discover it for yourself and you have to mm-hmm. do the work. So yeah. And I mostly, I, I haven't done a group in a while. I love doing groups. I haven't done them in a while. I may put one together in the future, but right now I'm really really focusing on working in the path. I'm working in three different path groups right now, which I love doing. It's wonderful. Um, And then I work with one-on-one with clients who my specialty, the, the, the people that I focus on are people who they know that this is what they want. They've decided that they're going to go alcohol free and they are looking for someone to walk alongside them. Like I said, and just be there to offer the tools to listen, to serve as a mirror, to work through the thoughts and beliefs that keep them stuck. Um, so yeah, that's what I do. And I feel so, so grateful. And as I know you both do too, yeah, it's yeah. kind of, it, it's the most amazing thing to be able to witness and be there for. We get to watch people transform every day. And it's just, yeah. it's, it's a really fortunate thing to be able to do. Yeah. 
It's pretty cool. Yeah. It is. It is. And it's funny, I had, a, just before we came on, I had a message from one of my clients and she's uh, come to, come almost to the end of her package. And I'd said to her, look, let, let's not hurry to book the next one in. Let's, if, if, it just felt like something needed to settle for a while. And so we kept in touch and she, she just messaged me to tell me like these two huge things that have taken place that have happened for her in this, this space. And so it's amazing when you see that transformation in real time, like on, on a call, you can have a, a moment with somebody and it something lands, they have their own insight, they discover for themselves something something that may have been there all along and that's amazing but equally so much happens in that space outside the space between calls and it's just it's really like it never gets old to see and it's and it's so unique everybody's um everybody's life life experience and their, their values and their intention and their goals like everybody has such a different plan and it's a real honor to be a small part of it, to, to, to witness some of it, to, as you said, to, to walk alongside somebody. And it's, 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 it's just magical. Absolutely love it. Yeah, I totally agree. Thanks for coming on. So cool. So is there any other, so, so is the website, is there anything else you want to, is yeah, any other links you'd love people to know? Or if you do, I'll put them in the show notes. So if anyone wants to go and find you, Mary, they all the stuff will be there. Um, but yeah, what a lovely and uplifting conversation. What good energy. It's a great this way. Great. Thank you both so much. I get to go be happy all day because we had this lovely talk. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. You're so you're, welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, Mary. It's just the, the best way to mark our 50th episode with... I think you may be our coolest guest yet. <laughs> and we've had some pretty cool guests. It's funny because I've always I've always looked at you from afar and I've said this to you before. When we when we were in coach training, I used to think, oh, she looks so cool. I want to be her friend, but I'm not cool enough to be her friend. <laughs> and like, you know, how you what you you're in, you're you're on Zoom and you you're looking at people in their little boxes and you're like yeah, she, she's she's really cool. I want to be friends with her, but she's so far out of reach. <laughs> and, then we, oh, and then we got to be friends. <laughs> that's absolutely crazy because that's I actually still feel that way about you. You're way too cool to be my friend. <laughs> she's not really. No, she is cool. Sometimes. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, and congratulations on 50th episode. Yeah, that's really cool. Awesome. That's fantastic. It's well done, guys kind it's of crazy kind of flash yeah. hasn't it mm. it's weird it really has so when this is airing we'll be getting ready for our one year anniversary as well which is going to be there's some cool things happening some big things happening but uh yeah awesome well thanks again for coming on pal and i have a funny feeling this won't be the uh the last time i'd love to be back cool take Thank care you guys. so much my darling <laughs>